So yes, so thank you very much to the organisers for putting together what looks like a really diverse and interesting meeting. I'm really looking forward to seeing how all these ideas kind of bump into each other. Um, so yeah, it's great to be here. Um, good to see that a British passport still works, at least for 18 more months that you know, they will let me across the French border. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Well, I mean, actually, Mokshe in particular did a really good job of setting up a lot of what I want to talk about. And there's been a few questions already which have been, this is nice, does this work for the discrete case? So my attempt, my talk is to, to kind of attempt to give partial answers to some of that, to say what I can say about discrete cases at least. So the sort of general plan, and I don't think anybody's going to disagree with this, is that Gaussian random variables are lovely. I mean, I, you know, it's a kind of brief summary of a lot of very deep ideas, but in lots and lots of ways, lovely properties seem to follow if you assume that things are Gaussian. So, I mean, what am I talking about? So for things that I'm interested in, for example, if you fix the variance, which is a very natural thing to do, Gaussian random variables maximize the entropy. So we have this entropy, which is a sort of interesting functional, and the place where it's biggest is the Gaussian. So that's, you know, that's nice. That kind of feels like a, a, an important connection. Uh, Gaussian random variables are stable. I mean, it's one of the first things you learn about them. If you have two normal distributions, you add them together, you get another normal distribution. If you have normal distributions and you scale them, you still get a normal distribution. And so this sort of central limit theorem kind of scaling keeps us in this class. So, you know, the Gaussians are nice in that sense. Um, they also seem to crop up in deeper places as well. So, for example, this famous, I've written EPI, entropy power inequality of Shannon, the case of equality is the Gaussian. You know, if the two summands are Gaussian, that precisely gives you equality in at least the one-dimensional entropy power inequality. And so, as mentioned before already, I think the, the entropy power inequality leads on to things like log Sobolev. And so it seems like the Gaussian is at the heart of, of those kind of results. And then, I mean, this is also a sort of theme that we've seen already, and I think it's going to continue all week that there are nice convexity properties associated with Gaussian, and in particular, convexity of entropy. So that's quite intimidating. I mean, that's a kind of a lot of very, very nice results saying that Gaussian random variables are, are, are lovely. And so what I'm going to do is I don't think I'm going to compete with that, but what I'm going to have are a few sort of disjointed ideas about discrete random variables. So when I talk about discrete random variables, I'm talking about things like Poisson random variables, not so much the geometric in this particular talk, but you know, geometric is obviously a nice random variable, binomial random variables, the sort of random variables you meet before you meet the Gaussian. You know, it's a strange thing. When you learn probability, you start off with discrete random variables. When you learn entropy, you start off with discrete entropy. And yet somehow the theory is much more developed in the harder case that people know much more of the story about continuous random variables than they do for discrete. Um, and if there is a single sort of message of this talk or something that seems to crop up, and we've seen this already, we need log concavity plus. This seems to be the message that um, we've seen how in this continuous world, having log concavity and then maybe a little bit more seems to be a useful property. So we want to capture what it is about log concavity in the, in the Poisson case, for example, that is nice. So what I'm going to talk about is taken from a bunch of papers. Um, if you are interested in following this up, then probably the best reference is something I wrote as a review article for this um, IMA workshop, which was a couple of years ago. Um, so this has just come out in this IMA Springer volume. And this kind of summarizes at least most of the ideas I'm going to talk about. So most of the things that I'm going to talk about are in that paper. So that's probably the best place to look. OK, so to give you a sort of general outline, the plan is I'm going to talk in four sections. Actually, the first three I'm going to talk about in a lot less detail. I'm just going to give a sort of flavor of a, of a few results for the first three topics. 
And then the final one, I think, is closest to the spirit of the workshop, so I want to talk the most about that. Um, okay, so as I say, we want some sort of idea of log concavity plus. So here is one idea of log concavity plus. This is something called ultra log concavity. And the idea is very simple. So what you do is you write pi of lambda for the mass function of a Poisson lambda random variable. So, you know, it's something we can write down. It's something you learn in the first course in probability. And it turns out that dating back a little while, dating back, I think, to the late 90s, uh, Mantle and Liggett sort of independently came up with this idea that there is this class of what are called ultra log concave random variables. So it looks a bit scary, but the main thing to say here is it's ULC lambda. So we're going to do two things. We're going to firstly fix the mean of our random variable. We're going to take random variables with mean lambda. And then what we're going to do is we're going to ask that the random variable has a mass function that's it's a little bit more than being log concave. So it's not just that PV is log concave, but that the ratio PV over pi lambda is, is log concave. And so this is somewhat in the spirit of these things that Mokshe was talking about. If you remember, Mokshe had these random variables where the density was e to the minus u, where the second derivative was bounded below. And so this is kind of doing the part of the bounding below the second derivative. I mean, this is actually quite a nice class. I mean, this is sort of partly um, why they studied it or why it was useful for them to formulate. It includes things like sums of independent Bernoulli random variables, uh, the Poisson is kind of obviously in there because the ratio is just one. Um, and also it's nice because it's preserved on summation. Hi. What do you mean by log concave? Ah, okay, that's a good point. So yes, I mean, maybe I should write that down. So I, what I mean is I mean log concave in a discrete sense. So what I mean is that PV squared over pi V squared is at least PV plus one over pi v plus 1 times pi v. So this is the sort of discrete version. It's not a, we don't have a second derivative. We'd like a second derivative, but um, this is what I'm going to assume. And so in this particular case, because as I say, we know what the form of these Poisson densities is, uh, Poisson mass functions is, most of those actually cancel. Most of those terms actually cancel. So you can rewrite this in this particular case, that nearly everything disappears, and what you end up with is a v on the left-hand side and a v plus 1 on the right-hand side. So the kind of standard definition of log concavity would just be that, and we're just requiring a tiny little bit more. We're just requiring that the ratio is just a little bit bigger than 1. OK, so this is sort of what got me into this, was that what I realized was this was a nice condition for this maximum entropy question. So what I was able to prove, and this actually dates back 10 years now, which is slightly scary, um, but that the Poisson is maximum entropy within this class. So in other words, if we've got x in this ULC class and we compare it with y, which is Poisson lambda, then the entropy of x is less than or equal to the entropy of y. And there's equality if and only if x is is itself Poisson. So that somehow feels like good news. I mean, it's an example of there's a very you know, simple result to prove in the continuous case. The proof of this isn't as nice, but at least the result ends up looking similar. You know, the result has the same sort of, the same sort of, kind of quality to it. Um, so that's a sort of example of the kind of results that I like, the kind of results that I'm interested in. OK, so the next thing I'm going to mention, I kind of hinted about this already. I said if you have continuous random variables and you scale them, then if you have a continuous Gaussian and you scale it, you, you still end up with a, a Gaussian. And we don't have immediately a, an equivalent of scaling discrete random variables. I mean, if you have an a integer-valued random variable and you multiply all the values by a half, you just have a random variable that's now a lattice distribution, but not on, you know, not on the integers anymore. So naively, just multiplying by the number isn't going to work. But what it turns out um, is that there's this very nice thinning construction that goes back to Rennie. I mean, Rennie introduced this for point processes, I think, in the 50s, um, that 
takes um, discrete random variables and gives you another discrete random variable. So just to kind of show you what's going on here, what we have is we have a random variable y, and I want to define a new random variable t alpha of y, which I'm going to call the alpha thin version of y. And what this is, is it's a random sum. It's a random sum indexed by y. So the way that you can think about this is that, I mean, as I say, Rennie introduced it for point processes. You have some number of points here that you know, represented those, the y points. And what we're going to do is we're just going to go through and we're going to flip coins associated with each one. We're going to flip a Bernoulli coin, Bernoulli alpha for each one. And so some of these will get wiped out. Some of these will get deleted. And so the t alpha of y is the sum of y Bernoulli sermons. It's what's left when you've gone through and done this um, thinning operation. So again, this is a sort of handy thing to have. I mean, the, the, the nice thing about it is, again, this, this leaves certain parametric families where they are. Um, it's a kind of, well, it depends where you did the first year of your probability course. But in some first year probability courses, they might ask you to prove that thinning a Poisson gives a Poisson. Maybe some other places it wouldn't be quite so soon. But it's, it's that sort of level of difficulty. If y is Poisson, then you can, you can calculate relatively easily that t alpha of y is also Poisson. So this is a, it's a nice operation because it keeps the Poisson family together. And so my contention is that thinning by alpha is the discrete equivalent of scaling by root alpha. So this is something that we've kind of argued quite a lot over the years. And there, you know, there are various papers where we have various bits of evidence to do with this. Um, but this t alpha construction seems very natural in this context. And so probably the, the best evidence for this is um, this result. And this looks a bit scary. But what this is, is it's a, a, a result that is to do with sums of thinned random variables. Now, probably the best thing to do is I'll, I'll, I'll flick on one and show you, because it's more likely you've seen the second result than you've seen the first result. So the second result is this Artstein, Bull, Bartnor monotonicity result. So this is what resolved this um, question, which dates back to Shannon, of in the central limit theorem, if you have more IID summands, it feels as if the entropy ought to go up monotonically. And it was known that it went up in powers of two, and nobody knew how to do it to show that it went up in general. And then this result came along and, and settled it. And I mean, this, it, it settles it as a corollary. I mean, that's the kind of cool thing about it, was that um, this you know, long-term unknown conjecture came out as a sort of special case of this inequality. But what we've got here is we've got, on the left-hand side, we've got the entropy of a term with n plus 1 um, terms in the sum. We've got n plus 1 terms in the sum. We get random variables x, and we scale them by root alpha, and we think about the entropy of that. And they showed that this is at least a linear combination. And this alpha j is, um, OK, I haven't defined this yet. Alpha j is 1 minus alpha j. So we've got weights that are adding up to 1. So it's the kind of sum of the weights without the jth term in. And it's the entropy of a, ter of a sum with n terms in. So we have the entropy of a, of, a, of a sum with n plus 1 terms in is at least the linear combination of the, the entropy of the thing with n terms in. And so the thing that's interesting is that once you've passed their result, if you then look up, you can see that the result that we're claiming is essentially the same. I mean, what's changed is that the continuous entropies have changed into discrete entropies, and that the, as I say, the, the scaling by root alpha has turned into thinning by alpha. That's the only thing that's changed. Um, Actually, there's one more thing that's changed, which is that we need this extra condition. We need this ULC condition. And that's kind of frustrating, because in, um, in their result, they don't need anything like that. Their result holds without qualification, whereas we do seem to genuinely need the ULC. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of an annoyance, that. But beyond that, what we were able to show was that this deep and powerful continuous result does have some kind of discrete counterpart. The frustrating thing is that their result leads on to lots of other good things. So for example, their result, and you know, Mark Shea's worked on this, um, leads on to 
um, kind of strengthened forms of the entropy power inequality. So it feels like this result is kind of better than the entropy power inequality. And you try and play the same games with this result to get a discrete entropy power inequality, and it doesn't work. So, so that's the kind of frustration with that. But it's, I think, interesting to see that, at least sort of formally speaking, you can write down inequalities that look very similar to the inequalities that are known in the continuous case. OK, so here's one more result that I'm going to talk about in not so much detail, which is, again, this is something that, <clears throat> that we've, we've heard a lot about already, but a, a log sob inequality. So here I'm actually going to switch the definition of log concavity plus. If you remember, I said we wanted log concavity plus, we wanted log concavity and something else, and now I'm going to actually change the definition that I'm going to use. I'm going to give a kind of alternative definition. And this isn't my alternative definition. I mean, what I said was that before we wanted, we, we, we didn't want just that this, this ratio was at least one, we wanted it to be a bit bigger than one. So what we're going to do is something slightly different, which is that we're going to, we're going to define on the top, we're going to take this, this kind of standard thing, and then we're going to divide it by a slightly odd looking thing. We're going to divide it by x, the, the mass function at x times the mass function at x plus one. I mean, this is sort of slightly non-intuitive thing to do. I mean, maybe it's sort of slightly more intuitive if you look at it like this, that you, you rewrite it like this and you can see that it's a difference of these ratios. It's a difference of the ratio at x to the ratio at x plus one. Um, I mean, this isn't my definition. This is, um, I put a question mark because I know it was in Caputo et al's paper and you know, I'm prepared to be told it's actually older than that, but that's, that's where I saw it first. So they, I mean, given a random variable, you can write down this, this curly E of V, right? I mean, if you give me the mass function, I can write down the, the curly E of V. What they introduced was this idea of what they call C log concavity. And so their condition is that they want this ratio to uniformly be greater than or equal to C. So they want this thing here I've written to be at least C for all X. So, well... Why is that a sort of sensible thing to do? Well, I think the obvious reason is if you think about the Poisson, if you think about V being Poisson here, what we have here, the ratio of X to X plus one is just going to be X plus one over lambda. And then the second term is going to be X over lambda. And so you subtract off those two things. What you see is that in the Poisson case, this EV term is uh, identically equal to one over lambda. So in the Poisson case, you can see that this um, C log concavity condition holds sharply. It kind of holds with equality everywhere that uh, we can just take C to be one over lambda and this condition holds exactly. So that's kind of encouraging. I mean, that's essentially the story of why we, the normalization is, is like, like it is. It's because you end up with this nice expression here. Um, the other thing to say is that this does relate to the ULC condition. I mean, it, they're not two completely separate things. What it turns out is that if the random variable is ULC, then it turns out to be C log concave, and you can even write down the value here. So this, the, the C is just the ratio of the first two probability values. So it's, it, 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 you know, it, it's in the same neighborhood as ULC, um, but it just seems more natural in this context. OK. so. The result I wanted to show you was a log sob inequality that I proved actually a couple of years ago now, um, and partly because it took me a long time to do the corrections and also because journals are slow to print things. This hasn't quite appeared in print yet. This is in a queue to come out in the uh, annals of IHP sort of fairly soon. But what, what it is, is is this. We have a sort of familiar kind of form on the left-hand side, at least, that what we have is we have this... Um, this French notation for the entropy, the entropy um, of a function with respect to, to the mass function V, and we will assume that V is C log concave. So we'll assume that, that V is C log concave, and we will think about positive functions. What it turns out is that we can upper bound this entropy by, and I'll admit it, it doesn't look the best, we can, we, we can upper bound it by, by this following thing. So we have the sum of V of X, and then we have this weird kind of 
construction that comes together with f of x plus 1 log of the ratio minus 1 plus the ratio. But the interesting thing here is this 1 over c. So the c log concavity feeds into the constant being 1 over c here. Now, this is, well, the first thing to say in my defense is that this, this right-hand side is unpleasant, um, but it's sharp. I mean, this is why you know, you're happy to see this, that if, at least in the Poisson case, if you take um, exponential functions, so if f of x is e to the ax plus b, it turns out that this whole thing just collapses down, everything holds with equality, and that's for all a and for all b. And so that's kind of at least a bit encouraging as to you know, why this right-hand side might not be a totally crazy thing to have. Um, but really, I think that the, the, the way to think about this is that this comes out of, so Caputo, Dipra, and Posta have this discrete form of this very beautiful bakri emery theory that uh, Mokshe talked about this morning. So what they had, uh, if you remember, Mokshe was talking about the evolution of Markov semigroups. They look at one particular Markov semigroup. They look at um, a sort of class of birth-death processes. And so they, they study a particular class of birth-death processes. And their, this C log concavity condition is exactly the same as the sort of standard Bakri Emery condition. But they have this machinery. And what I did was I applied their machinery. The only thing that's new here, I mean, they even had a log sub inequality before. The only thing that's new is that it's a sort of different form of the right-hand side. That what I, what I was able to do was just by kind of tweaking it to fit a sort of tighter bound in using their framework, using their construction. So just to give a kind of little bit more context about this. So the first thing to say is that there are various other discrete log Sobolev inequalities out there. So, um, I mean, I mentioned some names here. I mean, in particular, the very first result I saw was uh, like this was due to Bobkov and Michel, which was this result here, uh, which uh, I want to say 1998, but yeah, yeah, circa, circa 1998. I mean, this was, the first, this was the first time I was really introduced to this world. And, you know, it took me a long time to, to you know, get my head around exactly what it meant and all the ramifications. But they have this result in the Poisson case. And actually, this result follows from the result I just showed you. So if, if you do the sort of standard bound on the log, the fact that log of 1 plus u is less than or equal to u, um, and you reduce down to the Poisson case, then it turns out that that is a, is a sort of consequence of the result I gave you. So that's kind of encouraging. I mean, there are various other sort of forms of this. So, for example, um, you can sort of reformulate this in terms of what's called the size bias random variable. So this is the, the relative entropy from p to pi lambda. So this is how, how close is p to a Poisson. This is bounded by a constant times the distance from what's called the size bias version of p to p. So I don't really want to get into this what all that means, but there are, you know, this, this is a, a log sob inequality that was due to Wu um, that was you know, already in the literature. So somehow this result, it kind of feels like it tidies things up. It does the sort of discrete Bakri Emery thing that you'd hope, and it recovers the, um, the log sob inequality that was all, or various log sob inequalities that were already in the literature. Okay, so I'm going to sort of pause now and I'm going to kind of reboot and I'm going to, going to go back to assuming almost nothing. And I'm going to talk about a separate problem. And as, a, as I say, I think it's a separate problem that is sort of in the spirit of this workshop. And this is this shep olkin conjecture, which I don't know how many people have, have seen this before, but I think it's a lovely, lovely conjecture. And actually, I should mention it's one of two very lovely conjectures in that paper. And the other conjecture, I don't think anybody's ever done anything with. I'm not aware of any papers at all that deal with the second conjecture. So I'm going to talk about the concavity conge conjecture. So we're going to need some, some setting here. So here, here, here is the sort of the, the, the setup. What we have is we have one of the most basic kind of settings in probability, which is that we have a collection of coins. We're going to have n coins that we're going to flip, and they're going to... to have different potentially probabilities. So we're going to have a vector of probabilities p, p1 up to pn. So the, the, the important thing here is 
we're not thinking that these p's are, p, you know, the sum of the pi's is equal to one. We're thinking of these as being the success probabilities for particular coin flips. So, for example, we might well think that all the pi's are identical. It might be that, that you know, all these coins are the same, but there's a sort of general framework here that given a vector p of numbers between zero and one, we can think of those as success probabilities. We can create coins that have those as the success probability, and we can think about tossing them. So, what we might be interested in is what is the distribution of the sum of those um, of, of the coins? You know, what's the total number of heads we, ex we, we will see when we toss those coins? And so what we know is that, again, it'll be some sort of function of p, there will be a function of p um, that will dictate the probability that we add up those random variables and we get k. So it's, it, it, at each stage, it's a function of the vector of probabilities p. Um, and, you know, we could write this down. I mean, you could write it down in terms of kind of symmetric polynomials in uh, p over 1 minus p or something like that. I mean, but we don't really care right now. We're just going to say there is a sum. The mass function depends on the vector p. And so uh, an interesting object is this. What is the entropy of this function? So in other words, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of laboring the point, but the entropy is a function of the vector of, of probability values p. So the entropy is a function of these p's alone because, well, entropy is the sum of f log f, but the f's themselves depend on p. So what we have is we have, if you tell me the probabilities, we could work out and we could even, theory, you know, if we were feeling brave, we could write it down. We could say, what is the entropy of the corresponding random variable? You know, what's the pro what, what do we expect to see? So, based on various things, they came up with the following conjecture. And they came up with this conjecture in 1981. They conjectured that for any n, so for any number of coins, the function h of p, this entropy of the probabilities p, is a con concave function. Um, and so this is, this is what I want to talk about because it feels very much in the spirit of this workshop to be thinking about concavity of entropy and so on. I mean, the first thing to say is that um, it's a sort of technical point, but you don't really need to think about concavity as a function of general P, that what you can do is you can reduce this down to a um, to a one-dimensional problem. So in other words, if you're interested in concavity in a particular direction at a particular point, what you can do is you can just say, well, you know, what speed are we going and what direction when we come through that point? So what you can do is you can reduce it down to the case where all these p's are linear functions. So they're linear functions in the same parameter t. So there's a starting value and there's a finishing value, and we, we just linearly interpolate between them. OK, so what is known about this? Well, I think it's fair to say folklore is n equals 1. Folklore, n equals 1, is a single coin flip. It's one of the first things you do when you meet entropy is you, you draw this plot, and it, it looks like that. And um, you, know, you, you can take derivatives and see it's a concave function. Um, Shep and Olkin, in their paper, they just say it, it's true for n equals 2 and 3 as well. And actually, um, even n equals 3, if you want to sit down and just set off with the definition of the symmetric polynomials, I, I've never managed to make it work particularly nicely. I mean, they don't give you a hint as to how, how to do it. Um, you know, it just feels like an exercise in sort of grinding things and nothing seems to, nothing seems to particularly simplif simplify. So they, they claim that, but they don't prove it. I mean, I'm not going to argue with them. You know, I'm sure they, they did have a proof. They also prove the binomial case. So they also prove the case where um, all the coins are the same. So if all the coins are the same, they were able to prove it. So in the binomial case, it was true. So then I, I'm not aware of anything from then up to 2009. So I don't know whether this just implies that nobody actually thought it was an interesting question. I mean, it's entirely possible. But in 2009, um, uh, Yaming and I were able to prove another special case, and we, we, this kind of came out of something else that we were trying to do. But we were able to do the case where um, 
all the PIs start at zero or finish at zero. Um, so it's a particular special case, and in, in that setting, somehow it managed to work. And around this time, I also got an email from Owen, who was, I think, at this stage, finishing his PhD with Michelle. And he, he asked me this question, and I kind of thought about it a minute, and I said, um, no, I, I don't think you're going to be able to do that, because it reduces down to the shep Olkin conjecture, and you know, nobody knows how to prove that. So actually, Owen did, I think, better at that stage than I was expecting him to, because what he was able to do was to prove another special case. So the special case he was able to do was we had if you have some of these PIs are constant, and some of these PIs behave just like the binomial case, then he was able to do that as well. So it's, a, it, it, it's, I mean, he was explaining this in terms of translation of measures, that you have some particular measure that is made up of the constant part, and that what you're doing is you're kind of moving this across in a way that's dictated by this, um, this binomial part. So at this stage, what I said was, well, this seems jolly interesting. You know, we both think this is an interesting problem. Why don't we try and get some money and you can come to Bristol and we'll, we'll try and work on this? So this is what happened, was that Erwan came to Bristol as a postdoc for a couple of years and we spent a lot of time thinking about this problem. And so where we kind of, I don't know where this is where we started, but what we wanted to do was we wanted to understand this binomial case properly. So in particular, we had a sense that there was all this beautiful maths that uh, Mokshe talked about this morning to do with transportation of measure, curvature, all these kind of things, and that somehow the answer to this question had to be related to that. And so what we wanted to do to start off with was to try and understand this binomial case in that sort of language. So this was, this was where we came in. And so what I'll, I'll, I'll say something about how the binomial case works, because that motivates everything else that we do. So there's a little bit of notation here, again, which I apologize for. So I'm going to write delta star to be a spatial derivative. So I'm going to write star because it's not the one that you'd expect to take necessarily. So we'll take the derivative on the left. So we'll take k and we'll subtract off the value at k minus 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply define pt. So pt is going to be... Um, a function that linearly interpolates from a value p to a value q. So we start off at p, we end up with q, and so what I can do is I can simply consider this case. I can consider the case of a binomial with parameter pt. So t, this ft, it moves from being a binomial with parameter p to a binomial with parameter q. As t changes, this moves sort of smoothly through the world of binomials. And this is kind of interesting because uh, it feels like this ought to be a geodesic. If I give you a, bino a binomial with parameter p and a binomial with parameter q, it feels like the best way to get from one to the other ought to be to just keep going through the binomials. So what we were looking for was a way to understand that, a way to understand in what sense this was a geodesic, sort of with our kind of you know, biased feeling that it ought to be a geodesic, you know, in what sense could we argue that it was? Well, the absolutely obvious thing to do here, and this is, you know, this is even sort of, you know, goes back to the paper of Shep and Olkin, is that what you can do is you can just take this derivative here. You can take a derivative with respect to t, and what you end up with is something that is a little bit heat equation-y. So this is, what we have is we have a delta star here, so we have this sort of first order derivative, we have delta star, times some stuff. So we have n times q minus p. And then this is the thing that's really, really annoying, is that we set off with a binomial with parameter n, and you take a derivative and it turns into a binomial with parameter n minus 1. And that's kind of the most annoying thing that happens here, because, you know, it, it, it's nothing to do with the thing that you started with. You started with a, a, a sum of n coins, and now this is trying to tell you something about a, a sum of n minus 1 coins. And so we don't like that. So I, 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 I'm not, I mean, you know, the calculation is the calculation, but I'm not happy to see that that's the answer. So what I want to do is I want to kind of turn this back into something to do with the original random variable. And so this is something that Yaming kind of had independently noticed in something that he wrote about binomial distributions, is that actually, and it's a sort of curious fact, I mean, if you, if you well, 
if, if you're looking for something to do between now and lunch, you know, you can just sort of write down and just check that this all works out. But sort of as if by magic, the binomial with n minus one parameter n minus one actually hiding in there is a binomial with parameter n. So the binomial with parameter n minus one, you can rewrite as a linear combination. It's the, it's the linear combination of the binomial uh, th that we're interested in, the thing that we want. Um, so it's a linear combination of the value at k plus one and the value at k. And there are particular weights that come in here, and the, these weights are going to be important to us. So here we have a weight of k plus one over n, and here we have a weight of one minus k over n. So this is a kind of curious fact, and we didn't really know what to do with it, but it, it, it sort of feels like it might be important. So we felt like, well, OK, let's rewrite this simple calculation and rewrite it in this sort of notation. So what we did was that we just sort of rewrote it like this. We said that, OK, this derivative, instead of thinking about it as something to do with um, the mass function at n minus 1. Let's think about it as something to do with uh, this linear combination of mass functions. So given particular weights alpha, what we could do is we could construct out of the ft that we care about, we could construct this gt, so it's a linear combination of ft at k plus 1, and we're going to use weight alpha k plus 1 here, and we're going to use weight 1 minus alpha k there. So we're going to take a mixture, we're going to take a sort of weighted mixture of these two, uh, these two values and put them together into this form. So everything I've done is just, you know, it's, it's just a tautology. But in particular, the binomial case somehow looks quite nice if you do this, that it, 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 it is true in this form. Um, and the, what we get is that these weights, these alpha k are k over n, which are, you know, relatively simple kind of functions to have. And the other term I haven't mentioned is we have this term v sitting in here, which I'm deliberately using v for velocity here. Um, so the v that you get in this case is n times q minus p. And that's a constant. That's important to notice. It doesn't depend on k. It doesn't depend on t. And so back in this sort of world of sort of nice bakery emery kind of ways of thinking, thinking about geodesics and things like that, there is a sense that things that happen at a constant speed are nice. So somehow this seems like a useful family of processes to consider are processes that look a bit like this, in particular processes that don't, where the velocity doesn't depend on time. And so what we were able to do with this was we were able to um, think about this as an analog of the continuous transport of mass kind of constructions. And in particular, what we were able to do was to deduce a discrete version of what's known as the, the Benham Ubrania formula. And so this is, this is one of these sort of beautiful formulas that exists in the continuous world. And we were able to come up with something that, again, we kind of argue looks like an analog of this in the discrete world. So what do we do? Well, let's consider um, we're trying to move from F0 to F1. So we're going to consider the class of things that do that. So we'll consider the set of mass functions indexed by T that start off at F0 and end up at F1. So we'll consider the set of paths that go from one mass function to the other. So it's, you know, it's an object. It's a, it, we can think about all the possible ways we could walk from, from one distribution to another. And what we can also do is we could think about the set of all the possible weights. So we have all these possible weights here, these alpha k's that I've talked about. I'm going to put on a particular restriction, which is I'm going to want the, for various sort of not very interesting reasons, I want alpha of 0 to be always equal to 0. I'm going to want alpha of n to always be equal to 1. But in between that, I'm not going to care. I'm going to say we can take any weights we like so long as the weights are between 0 and 1, so long as these are actually kind of honest weights. So we have pz is the class of roots that take us from f0 to f1. Curly a is the set of weights that satisfy these sorts of technical conditions. OK, so then what, what you can do is you can, given a path and given the weights, you can write down the equivalent of what I just did. 
So let's, let's do that carefully. So given a path going from F0 to F1, given a collection of these weights, what we can do is we can define the GT of alpha, that's the linear combination. So that's the first thing we'll do. So the, the GT of alpha is the linear combination of the F distribution. So given any particular weights you give me, I can, I can define a new probability distribution like this, you know, as a linear combination like that. And then what I can do is I can just take to be the velocity field, the thing that's sitting in there. So what I can do is I can take, I can implicitly define the, in now in full generality, V of alpha, T, and K to be the thing that sits in here that makes this, this derivative true. So the V of alpha, T, K is the thing that comes inside this, this equation here and makes this true. Oh, and I apologize, I notice I've, I've now, my delta stars have changed into to, to delta one. I apologize for that. Okay, so, but, you know, formally speaking, we can do this. You give me the root, you give me the weights, we can write down the, the derivative, and this implicitly defines the V. And then the final thing that we can do is we can say, okay, based on the sort of benamou brenier type argument, it turns out that a sort of interesting way to measure the cost is to measure it kind of quadratically in terms of, of, of V. So we can take the square of this velocity, take the, the, the square of the velocity and sum it weighted by G. So this is the kind of inner term. This is how things are changing for a particular T and we integrate it from zero to one. And so if you've never seen the benamou brenier formula before, this is going to be absolutely no use to you. If you have seen the benamou brenier formula before, then it might make a little bit of sense. But the idea is that we're measuring how much it costs us to move from zero to one. And the way that we're doing this is we're, we're, we're measuring incrementally at each stage, at each value t, how much it's costing us to move a sort of infinitesimal amount. And so what we can do is we can just stick an infimum on the outside of this. We can say, OK, for any particular path and for any particular weights, we can define this to be the distance, how long it, how long it takes us to get there. But what we can do is we can look for the shortest distance. We can look for the, of all the paths and all the weights, what's the smallest we can make this, we can make this quantity. And so what we then did was we said, well, Anything that, anything that has equality here, anything that achieves this infimum, we are going to argue is a geodesic. I mean, it's probably a non-standard geodesic, and I, I know there are other ways to do this, but this is our particular choice. We'll say that anything that has equality here, we're going to think of as being a geodesic. Okay, so I, I have a bit of an eye on the time, but from what I've shown you already, it turns out that this, the, that binomial path I talked about, it is a geodesic. It, it turns out that the, as I say, the velocity field is exactly constant, and so this turns out to be a geodesic. So interpolating in the way that you'd like, you get the right answer, or you get the answer that you'd expect. And so these constant speed paths, these ones where the V doesn't depend on K, uh, doesn't depend on, 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 on T or K, um, turn out to be particularly nice here. So what it turns out is that there are various things that we can prove here, and I'm not going to talk about all of them in a lot of detail, but the main thing is that this Vn, it forms a metric between probability measures, and the interesting thing is sometimes it coincides with W1. So Mokshe talked a lot about the Wasserstein distance W2 this morning, but actually it turns out that in certain cases, this Vn turns out to be the same as W1. So W1 is the version of the Wasserstein distance where instead of taking the second power, you just take the first power. And so it's slightly mysterious to me why that happens. I don't have a good explanation as to why W1 is the right thing to come up with here. But you know, nonetheless, this was something that we were able to do. We were able to argue that this is a metric. We were able to argue that it has a sort of you know, reasonably nice property. OK. now. You may remember about 20 minutes ago, I was talking about the shep olkin conjecture, and I've kind of completely gone off, you know, I haven't mentioned entropy concavity, but we were doing all of this because we wanted to do entropy concavity. So what we would like to do is we would like to be able to say something about, you know, we've defined a geodesic, now we understand which paths are nice, and we'd like to be able to say something about, okay, this is a nice path, and it's a particularly nice path because 
the entropy is concave along it. So we know that it's true in the binomial case. We have this result of um, Shep and Olkin proved it for the binomial case. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to give conditions in terms of alpha t of k that sort of generalize that. So we'd like to find conditions that are true for the binomial case, but are true in more generality. So in that case, just to remind you, the alpha t of k was k over n. So we have three conditions. And here are the three conditions. The first two are sort of relatively straightforward. So the first two conditions are that these alpha coefficients should be monotone in k. They should be increasing in k. So as I say, in this binomial case, I said that the alpha was k over n, and so that's, that's going to be increasing in k. So that's fine. So you know, it's a more general class. So we, we will require that these things are monotone in k. We will also require that they're monotone in t. So in other words, that um, the derivative with respect to t is, is going to be positive. These things are going to be increasing in t. I mean, I'm not expecting anybody at all to see why these are sort of useful things, other than that they are satisfied for the, um, for the binomial case. And then the final condition, so we've got k monotonicity, t monotonicity, and what we call generalized log concavity. So generalized log concavity um, is a bit like this. What we have is we have the f distribution here at k plus 1 and the product at k and k plus 2. And again, we're going to require a sort of weighted version of this. And the weighted version that we're going to require is going to depend on the coefficients themselves. Now, this is less obvious that this is satisfied by the binomial, but it turns out that this is also satisfied OK by the binomial. Now, obviously, there's a certain amount of kind of reverse engineering here, but what we were able to prove was we were able to prove the following result, that if we have a constant speed path, then if the k-monotonicity condition, the t-monotonicity condition, and the GLC condition hold, then the entropy is a concave function. So that was what we were able to do. And we were kind of happy with that because, you know, we'd, we'd set off to do shep -Olkin. We found a class of things that includes the binomial. And so it feels like, um, it feels like we should be done. Now, the problem is, and this is where this definitely gets too much detail, but the problem is that the t-monotonicity condition isn't true. Or for some shep paths, the t-monotonicity condition isn't true. So you can't just plug into the theorem I just showed you and say, ah, oh, therefore the shep uh, result holds. So we spent a certain amount of time kind of cursing and checking the calculation. But what we came to realize was that the t-monotonicity condition was too long. It was too, was, you know, sorry, it wasn't the right condition. So what we were able to do was to weaken that condition. So we weakened it and replaced it by something that we call, uh, imaginatively enough, condition four. Um, and I'm really not going to get into what this is. But what we were able to show was that, firstly, that condition four does hold for shep olkin paths. And that secondly, that this result is still true, the entropy is still concave um, under condition four. So what we were able to do was we were able to actually prove this theorem. We were able to replace the conjecture by a theorem. So we have proved that for any n, the function from p to h of p is concave. Um, and this actually happened in two stages. So what we did was that the first paper which came out relatively recently in the Annals of Probability, we considered a special case. We considered the case where all these p's are going in the same direction. So it's a sort of stochastically ordered case where all these p primes all have the same derivative, or all have the same sign of their derivative. So we did that case using this sort of transportation kind of arguments. And we thought that was kind of a very small part of the, of the problem. But actually what it turns out is that that's the worst case in the sense that we kind of then quantified. It turned out that that was the worst case. And so what we were able to do in a sort of second paper, a follow-up paper that just came out in Bernoulli, was to show that actually because that's the worst case and we know it's true in the worst case, then we we're able to prove the result in general. So it's a, it was a sort of 
convoluted route we took to get there, but in the end, we were able to replace this conjecture by a theorem. Okay, I have two minutes left, and I know lunch is, is waiting, but I'm just going to give you a conjecture to replace the conjecture that we proved. So, entropy is only one of many entropies, as you know. So, here is a, a generalization that what we now believe is if you think about Rennie entropies, then we know that the Shannon entropy is the same as the Rennie entropy for um, Q equals 1. But actually, what we believe is something like Shep-Olkin should hold if the Q parameter is sufficiently small. There's, there's some kind of critical QR star the, such that the entropy is concave below that value and that the entropy is not necessarily concave above that value. So there is some particular value of Q where the, the transition happens, that up to a certain point, these things are always concave. Afterwards, they may or may not be. There is a corresponding conjecture about Salis entropy. I mean, normally you're used to Rennie and Salis being, this, being just functions of each other, but actually in this case, because we're talking about concavity, it actually matters whether you're talking about Rennie or whether you're talking about Salis. Um, and I'll actually even give you what I think the values are. So I think that the... Well, this may be evidence that Rennie is nicer than Salis, by the way. I, I think that the answer is 2 for, for Rennie. So in other words, that if you look at Rennie entropy for 2 and below, then it's always going to be concave. And if you look at Salis entropy for 3.65986 and below, then it, it's also going to be concave. So specifically, we have examples for these particular values. We have examples where it isn't concave just above this. So that's kind of evidence that, that these might be the right values. And you know, we, we don't have any more than that. But I think it's an interesting problem in the sense that the, the Sher-Polkin problem was interesting. But if you think about it, there's no reason that the Shannon entropy is particularly special. And so it would be nice to know whether or not these things hold. OK, so thank you very much for listening. I, I really had better stop there. that all uh, the asymptotic behavior of, uh, uh, of uh, system at the border of chaos can have a Q entropy, but also an other parameter entropy. Oh, OK. So it, it would be absolutely great if you have also a conjecture for the other parameter. Excellent. OK, so it's a two-dimensional problem now rather than a one-dimensional. OK, so we, 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 we've solved it at a point. I thought we needed to do it on a line. We need to do it on a region. OK, excellent. I know less than I knew before. Excellent. So maybe to be on time for lunch, especially on the first day of the conference, it would be better if we stop now and move quickly to the dining room. Thanks to the, all the speakers of this morning's session.